I, Isabel Anderson, give and devise to the town of Brookline, Massachusetts, all my estate known as Weld, with the dwelling house and other buildings thereon, to be used by said town for the purposes of public recreation, or for charitable purposes, or for purposes of public education. The estate that the town of Brookline received in 1948 was not only one of America's most prestigious and beautiful landscape gardens, it was also the home of a devoted and public-spirited couple. Lars and Isabel Anderson opened their estate of 62 acres time and again to the citizens of the town of Brookline. And her bequest showed her interest in that being continued uh, forever after they were gone. In the subsequent years, the park has only been used for one of her purposes, which is public recreation. Uh, the community and the, um, the charitable, the education purposes were not. In addition, I would say that over the past four decades uh, that the town has had it, uh, it showed what America and what this town in particular felt about the use of public space and the environment. The Andersons opened up their estate and invited the public to, to share the pleasures of it on lots of different occasions. Sometimes there would be outdoor concerts. Sometimes they invited troops of actors and actresses to come and perform plays that Mrs. Anderson had written. And sometimes they had lots of get-togethers for children, uh, opportunities for children to, to explore the grounds of the estate. and. Mrs. Anderson had a particular fondness for children. She wrote children's stories for them and wrote plays for them as well. In reading the letters of Lars and Isabel Anderson and the journals of, of Lars Anderson, I've learned that the Andersons were energetic and creative people. They were outgoing. They were a very romantic couple. And they were very curious about the world beyond Brookline. Isabel met Lars when she was traveling in Europe on the Grand Tour after her graduation from the Windsor School in 1895. Lars was already working in Europe at that time. After returning to the United States to be married in Boston, they took off once again, and on their honeymoon, they visited Hawaii, Japan, and China. Lars's uh, activities as a diplomat and an, an ambassador took them all over the world, and this interest uh, and ideas of the world beyond Brookline uh, were expressed in the architecture of their home here and in the design of the landscape. Well, the Andersons were extremely interested in landscape architecture, and they brought back from their travels uh, a number of international styles. Uh, the uh, creating the gardens at Brookline in a very short period of time, the first decade of the century. Uh, they created an Italian garden, uh, a water garden, a Japanese garden, uh, and in addition to these principal uh, gardens, they built uh, a number of smaller, uh, like a rose garden, a, a, a alley, a long alley, a rond point for theatricals, all this done in a very brief period of time. Once at home again, Isabel and I found Weld on its hilltop, as dear and lovely and full of happiness as ever. Early in October, the gardens were still gorgeous, their coloring intensely brilliant. We walked along the fountains and columns that recall the blessed times we had spent together. The great wine and oil jars from the gardens of Rome, Florence, Cordova, no wonder it was a happy place for us to linger in. You really can't invent a new garden style. You're always reacting to something that's coming from somewhere, whether it's your own culture or somebody else's. But we're a, a young country, and we were an especially young country at the end of the 19th century, and these ideas had to come from somewhere. But I think what makes these gardens deeply American is the sense that you could pick and choose from so many different cultures 
and in a way invent your own world and that people did that with such energy and such panache and it wasn't really Victorian um, in the sense of collecting precious little bits from other countries it was we'll take this and we'll take this and we'll take this and bang this is uh, what we end up with something new something American in 1905, Weld was considered to be one of the most famous gardens in America. This is because it uh, reflected so clearly the genius of Charles Platt, then the leading architect and one of the leading landscape architects in the country. In the Italian garden, uh, the landscape architect Charles Adams Platt took a number of typical Italian garden features, uh, for example, the pergola, uh, the uh, fountains, uh, the uh, terraces, uh, and individual specimens of sculpture. Uh, and he combined them uh, in uh, a way that was uh, very new uh, and, uh, and different. Uh, for example, uh, he used a profusion of flowers uh, in the garden. Uh, he used a lawn, which was a set uh, for uh, theatrical performances. Uh, in his assessment, he was not reproducing an Italian garden. Instead, he was creating a genuinely new American uh, garden style. Lars and Isabel traveled uh, frequently to Japan, and they created at Weld a Japanese garden as a, as a memory of those trips. Uh, they used here an, a number of elements uh, that are very oriental, for example, gravel and small water features, stone lanterns. But they also combined these and brought in other elements that are very non-Japanese. For example, a great uh, bronze eagle. Uh, they uh, later, in 1913, imported a number of very famous bonsai trees, uh, which are now in the Arnold Arboretum. The water garden is essentially English, but it also introduces some continental features. Uh, for example, the bridge balustrades uh, were based on the uh, uh, Isolata uh, at the Boboli Gardens in Florence. Uh, the Temple of Love uh, is an almost direct quote uh, from a, a similar temple built in the 18th century at Versailles and, and is one of the most beautiful parts of the, of the entire estate. The estate that Lars and Isabel Anderson left to the town of Brookline in 1948 underwent physical changes in the ensuing years. In 1955, the mansion was torn down. In the following years, the Italian garden was replaced with a skating rink. The kitchen gardens were demolished uh, along with the greenhouse and they were replaced by the town's park yard garage. The wooden arbor with the Chinese pagoda fell apart the Water Garden, the Japanese Garden, and the Four Seasons Theater also deteriorated and disappeared. World War II marked the end of the golden age of American gardens. Um, the labor shortages caused by the war made it impossible to keep most of these places going. And when people came back, wage scales had shifted. So it was very difficult to have 20 or 30 people on site to take care of a big estate. People's ideas about what a garden should be changed. They wanted to barbecue. They wanted to swim in their backyards. And these big fancy estates seemed to be more reflections of wealth than anything else. People were uncomfortable with them. And so we let most of these places disappear, not seeing them as important works of American art, and not really being far enough away from them yet historically to value them. 
During the past 40 years, the status of Lars Anderson Park has really been a reflection of society's attitude towards historic landscapes and open spaces. The years during the 1950s and 1960s were marked by benign neglect. In the early 1980s, however, people's attitude towards historic landscapes began to change. In the mid-1980s, Lars Anderson Park was nominated by the Brookline Preservation Commission to the National Register of Historic Places, and it was accepted to the National Register. Initially, that was difficult for some people to understand because they were used to a building being listed in the National Register, a building such as the Museum of Transportation, which is located in the park. However, they couldn't understand how historic landscape could be part of the National Register. Uh, they quickly, however, began to understand that concept and turn their thoughts into action. I love the outdoors and landscape. I do photography. I have children. I have uh, a love of ice skating. And I came up to the Auto Museum as well. So it was a place for, uh, for me for many, many, uh, many activities. And uh, I met a lot of people here, too. I used the gardens. Um, I did notice that the place was a mixture of decay and of great beauty, and that it needed work. And then when I heard that the town was receiving a million-dollar grant, there was great, uh, great excitement, many people. Uh, there was also great concern. You know, when you take something for granted, you don't feel that you have to protect it or do anything. There's the hill, and it's terrific. And then the hill was threatened with a playing field that somebody was going to come in with a bulldozer and level out part of that hill. And just the whole town just went, no! There had been existing plans from the application that included a lighted ball field that would have cut into the hill. That was the source of great concern to a lot of people who used that hill for flying kites, just to look at. And uh, that got a lot of people very interested in how that money would be spent. The master plan grew out of the uh, public hearings and working with the landscape architect in charge of the project and park and recreation. It was a long process. There was lots of controversy. Out of that came a master plan of consensus for phase one, which was implemented, and the million dollars was spent on renovating those structures that were to, uh, would fall down within a year or so. But there's about $3 million more work to be done. A lot was accomplished during phase one of the restoration program, some of it quite subtle and not immediately apparent to the park visitor, such as the restoration of the masonry walls at the top of the hill, or even the installation of the drainage pipes around the lagoon area. If the restoration is to continue, people need to come together. Members of the community need to come together and continue to discuss and express their ideas for the uh, use of the park and discuss their vision for the park. What seems very exciting is that places like Lars Anderson Park all over the country are being recycled into new public use. They were designed as private pleasure grounds, and now you see people pushing their babies and throwing baseballs and reading under trees, and yet on some level responding in these parks to the complexity and the subtlety and the carefulness of design which made them masterpieces a hundred years ago and make them masterpieces still today. The first impression that I get from this park, and it's one that I keep with me all the time, is of the, the great hill and the sky that's beyond it. And because I have a belief that the eye needs more room than the body, I always come to it and experience the sense of freedom of walking on the hill or going down and being lost around the pond. It's a very liberating experience to be in this park for me. In their day, uh, Isabella and Lars Anderson brought the landscape architecture of the world to Brookline, as well as their pleasure in open spaces and a natural environment. It's quite an inheritance. As Isabella and I sat by the fire one day, in the den at Weld, with the map of the world unfolded before us, we realized that we had covered most of it. We had circled the globe several times, as well as the continents of South America and Africa. 
We had cruised among faraway islands of the east and visited many odd corners of the world. Over many seas we had flown our black horse flag. We'd sailed to the land of the midnight sun and traversed the desert of Sahara. We'd watched the sun gleam on pagodas and twilights fall as the voices echoed from minaret to minaret. Our many years of married life had really been unique. Always Isabel and I had pulled together. We had known the best times of our century and had been active in the most fortunate era of a civilization that had touched great heights, just as today it is touching great depths. And in our life at home and abroad, we had numbered among our friends all sorts and conditions of people. Once more, as we had for nearly 40 years, Isabel and I faced the glory of the western sky and watched the sun go down on our happiness. April 1936.